great to see you. Uh, we are in our last and final message through the book of Jonah. And remember, the goal of the whole series is to make Jesus known, but not like Jonah. To not follow Jonah's example at all. Remember, God asked Jonah to go, uh, to, go to the Ninevites and make him known, in a sense. Uh, he said, you know, Jonah, their evil and their violence has come before me, and I want you to take a message of repentance to them. Go and tell them to turn from their ways. In fact, that's what we looked at uh, last week. We spoke about repentance, which means to turn 180 degrees in light of who God is, in light of His holiness, in light of His mercy, and in light of who we are, in light of our sinfulness, so as to experience His forgiveness and experience peace from Him. Well, Jonah was absolutely repulsed at the idea, and he literally ran in the opposite direction to Nineveh, to a place called Tarshish, well, attempted to get to a place called Tarshish, which uh, was considered the furthermost point in the known world at that stage. You get there, and then it, there's nothing more. It's just ocean, then maybe you fall off the end of the, the world, or whatever they were thinking at that stage. But as we've been seeing, God is not done with this obstinate, rebellious uh, prophet, and he pursues him. Out of love for Jonah, uh, he, he pursues him uh, in the form of a storm, which uh, results in Jonah being thrown overboard uh, and then being swallowed by a giant fish. And it's inside this fish for three days and three nights that Jonah rekindles his relationship with the Lord, and then the Lord promptly has the fish, as the text says, vomit him out uh, onto the dry land. Jonah goes off to Nineveh, and uh, he preaches a very short and a very sharp sermon regarding God's judgment against their sin, and then what we can only describe as a mass revival. The entire city, including the king, repent from their ways. And in so doing, they experience the forgiveness and peace with God. And we also concluded that if we turn from our self-centered ways and we turn to the way of God, that we would begin to experience the ultimate reason and the ultimate purpose for our existence. And that is that we would begin to live lives that glorify God and that we would begin to enjoy God. That, that as mankind, we are designed by God to live for God. And when we, and when we do that, we begin to experience uh, our greatest and deepest joy and satisfaction in life. And that is God. And He will be most glorified in that. And so in making Jesus known, we essentially want people to turn from their ways to the way of Jesus so as to begin to grow and grow in this life that makes much of God in everything that we do and enjoy Him. But there is a stumbling block to this. There is a stumbling block to this, which we're going to look at this morning. And, and a stumbling block that was still very apparent in Jonah, even though he had finally obeyed God and he went off to Nineveh, which just proves that Jonah is still a work in progress, and you and I, we're still works in progress. And it's a stumbling block that begins in the heart and can be expressed either subtly or quite openly. And so when it comes to making Jesus known or to telling people about what we believe as Christians, uh, fear might be a stumbling block. You know, we, we fear what people might think of us. We fear that we might get canceled on social media or we fear that we might be rejected by a particular group of people or even by a particular friend. But what I want us to talk about this morning has a very sinister element to it if we really think about it. We're going to talk about fighting off self-righteousness as a stumbling block to making Jesus known. Without even you know, having to look up a definition of self-righteousness, we can see that it quite clearly revolves around self. It revolves around ourselves and the rightness of that self, the rightness of ourselves. My way is always the right way. My opinion is always the right opinion. My viewpoint or my morals are always the right way. Uh, my outlook on life is always right. And the way that plays out can be subtle in the form of passive aggressiveness or very demonstrative or demonstrative behavior, especially if that person doesn't get their own way, which we will see shortly in Jonah. 
But because self-righteousness sorry, revolves around ourselves, around self, it lacks compassion. In fact, compassion is swallowed up by judgmentalism. The self-righteous person is constantly weighing up whether a particular person or maybe a, a particular group is worthy of their time, worthy of their expertise, worthy of their kindness, worthy of their generosity. And if we as Christians struggle with self-righteousness, then it will affect either consciously or, or subconsciously who we share Jesus with or not. And so in our last section here in Jonah, we are going to see how we can fight off this nasty stumbling block of self-righteousness in making Jesus known. And we'll do it by contrasting Jonah and God. In fact, that, that's what chapter 4 does. It's a contrast between the character of Jonah and the character of God. And if we think about it, if anyone deserved to be self-righteous, it would be God, because he is he is righteous. Everything about him and therefore everything he does is perfectly right. His entire self is righteous, good, and holy, and perfect. And in comparison to him, we all fall way short of him. And yet instead of being self-righteous, as the most righteous being, he chooses to have mercy and compassion on fallen humanity. And so if you and I, if we're going to make Jesus known, we need to be a lot less like Jonah and a lot more like God. We need to fight off self-righteousness and replace it with compassion. We need to fight off self-righteousness and we need to replace it with compassion. And this is how we're going to do it this morning. We fight off self-righteousness by, number one, remembering God's compassion to us, remembering we are not to condemn and then lastly, remembering to embrace God's missional heart. So here we go. We fight off firstly self-righteousness by remembering God's compassion to us. This is our first defense mechanism. If we can remember that we are recipients of God's compassion, then we should be willing agents of it to others. But the moment we forget or the moment we think we deserve God's compassion that's when we'll immediately begin to judge whether others, we think others are worthy of it or not. It's incredibly arrogant, an arrogant way of thinking about things. You know, I will decide whether you are worthy of hearing the good news of Jesus or not. I mean, what, what makes us think that we have the ability and the authority to make that kind of decision? And so Jonah running away from God was a demonstration of his self-righteousness and the subsequent decision that the Ninevites were not worthy of the truth. And so Jonah had forgotten that he and his entire nation, the Israelites, were recipients of God's compassion. And secondly, that he had elevated something else above God. Let me show you. Let's have a look at the last chapter together. Chapter 4 from verse 1 says this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, or can be translated, it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. What was? The Ninevites repenting, and God not punishing them for their evil and their violence. And so as a result, he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me. What a grumpy old man. For it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? I mean, one of the things we cannot accuse Jonah of is fear. I mean, he didn't run from the Ninevites. He was not afraid of the Ninevites. He just didn't want them to repent. And he's not afraid to tell God exactly how he feels about God in light of it. Now listen, yes, through Jesus we can boldly come before the throne of God. The writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 14 verse 16, but not with a self-righteous attitude. And yet once again, God demonstrates such patience and grace with him. God asks, do you do well to be angry? As in, wait, 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 hang on a second, Jonah. 
Do you think it's right to be angry over this? Are you justified to be angry over my compassion toward the Ninevites? Have you forgotten something, Jonah? But now if we look at what Jonah says, it seems like he hasn't forgotten the compassion of God. I mean, he describes God as gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In fact, what Jonah is doing here, he's quoting Scripture. He's quoting Exodus chapter 34 from verses 6 to 7. And so he knows his Bible. And and if we remember, the whole Exodus account is about God having compassion on the nation of, of Israel long before Jonah was even born when they were slaves in Egypt. And so God sends Moses to set them free to, and to lead them out to the land of Canaan, this, this land that's uh, described as flowing with milk and honey, a place where God would prosper them and give them peace. But if you remember the story, all they did along the way was moan and groan. And yet through it all, God showed grace, mercy, was slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And now you fast forward many, many years and the time of Jonah and the entire nation of Israel, they've been in Canaan now many years and they're at this particular time enjoying a a time of political peace and prosperity. Their boundaries are even increasing. In contrast, their enemies, the Ninevites, were experiencing a famine, there was political upheaval internally and there were threats from two other nations, warring nations on them. And so instead of realizing what God has done for the nation, he quotes the scripture in an accusatory way. He says, it's because you are compassionate that I ran away to Tarshish. Well, attempted to run away to Tarshish. Meanwhile, God has, been, has, done, has, been, has done nothing but uh, being compassionate towards them. Year after year. And not just to the whole nation, but to Jonah personally. I mean, has, has Jonah... Honestly forgotten that he was at the bottom of the ocean with his lungs filling up with water before God sent a big fish to swallow him up and sustain him in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights, never mind the lack of oxygen and all the gastric acids. So what's really going on here? What is hindering Jonah from truly grasping God's compassion towards his nation, towards himself, and towards the Ninevites. Well, there's a clue in his desire here for God to take his life. Have a look at verse 3 again. It says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I mean, it's an alarming statement. This is the the demonstrative side to self-righteousness when it doesn't get its own way. This is worse than a three-year-old throwing a tantrum and then sulking. Jonah does not want to live anymore. And two words tell us why. They give us the reason behind this statement. It's the words, therefore and better. Therefore meaning, therefore in light of who you are, God, in light of you being a compassionate God, In light of you showing compassion to whoever you want to show compassion to, I would rather die. Why? Because he has something better in mind. And because he doesn't get it, he now wants to die. Because God has mercy and compassion on the Ninevites, he would rather die. But that exposes, like I said in the beginning, something pretty big and something pretty sinister around self-righteousness. What is this better? What is this better that would actually cause Jonah to to live and want to thrive? Whatever that is, that's his true God. It's better than God. It's better than the compassion of God. And we could argue, as we did in the first sermon, that it's hyper-nationalism. That's the belief that your nation or your ethnicity is far superior than anyone else's. I think I quoted this in our first sermon as well, but have a look at this from Tim Keller. He says, One sign that you're idolizing your nation or your ethnicity is when your race becomes more fundamental to your identity than your faith in God. 
So if it is true in what Keller is saying that our identity comes from what we believe, what we're believing in, then we will naturally live it out because we live out our identity. You are and you do what you believe. Therefore, if we believe in God, theoretically, we should be becoming more like God. We become people of truth and compassion. Jonah knew the truth, but he lacked the compassion because his self-righteous hyper-nationalism was his God. And this is quite scary because, because the fact that God had chosen the nation of Israel to be his people and chosen Jonah to be his prophet, it should have resulted in the nation of Israel and Jonah being humble, incredibly humble. Jonah and Israel were the unconditional choice of God. Meaning they didn't have to you know, uh, earn it or live a certain way or, or be a certain way in order to earn this choice. No, it was God's unconditional choice of them. And yet, Jonah in particular is acting as if he deserves God's grace and love and no one else. To be blessed with the love of God and to be blessed with the truth of God should not result in self-righteousness, but rather compassion. If it results in self-righteousness, that means we are actually viewing ourselves better than God and God simply becomes the means to making us feel more superior about ourselves. And so we can see how dangerous this is for us as Christians. Because listen, there's a difference between being accused of being self-righteous and actually being self-righteous. Here's what I mean. You know, we, we believe as Christians that we worship the one true God. We worship the one true God. And we didn't make that up. Jesus himself tells us that. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm not one of many ways. I'm not one of many possible truths or possible paths. I am the way because he is God. Furthermore, Acts 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, talking about Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven, that's pretty much everywhere, given among men by which we must be saved. There's only one way. Now many outside of the Christian faith will, will look at that and go, Oh, you Christians. You, you Christians are so narrow-minded, you're so arrogant to believe that your faith is the only way. You're so rigid in your mind to think that your truth is the only truth, the absolute truth. It's so self-righteous. Now, if you're here, or maybe you're watching online, and, and you agree with that argument, I, I can see why. But here's what you need to consider. That ap accusation can be reciprocated. If you disagree that Jesus is the only way, then you're holding to another way. could be like, hey, no, no, you know, all paths lead to God. And if you believe that that is the correct way, then you believe that it's superior to what we as Christians believe, and therefore you can also be accused of being self-righteous. But now, Sunrise, it's, it's an argument that we just have to make peace with. It's an argument that is to be expected. What, though, is unacceptable is if our attitude and our actions, knowing that we have the truth, comes across self-righteously and without compassion. That we come across more like Jonah and less like Jesus. That we begin to pick and choose who we think God should have compassion on and who he shouldn't have compassion on. So back to our mission this morning, how do we then fight off self-righteousness? Well, we remember the compassion Jesus showered upon us at great cost to himself. Take Romans 5, verse 10, for instance, says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Do you see that? God considered us as enemies. Yet Jesus dies to reconcile us to God. If that is how God treats his enemies, then how are we to treat ours? 
how are we to treat those who are just simply different to us? Have a different worldview, different mindset. And before we start justifying ourselves and the reasons why we should like or not like a particular person or a particular people group, we are to remind ourselves of who we were once before a very, very holy God. We were his enemies, whom he could justifiably obliterate, but instead he chose to have compassion. And the extent of that, com that compassion is seen on the cross. Jesus taking the offense between us and God upon himself so that we might not be enemies anymore, but rather the adopted children of God. And I definitely don't do it enough, but preaching the gospel like Romans 5 verse 10 to yourself every single day, it will combat self-righteousness and it will begin to produce humility. And when we are humble, we don't see ourselves as higher than others, but we begin to see ourselves as servants of God's compassion and servants of His truth to the world. Which then leads us to the next way we combat self-righteousness, and that is we do not condemn, point number two. And so condemnation is more than just a strong disapproval of something or someone. It's to attach a corresponding action to the judgment. So to pronounce condemnation over someone is to declare yourself superior and therefore their judge, therefore their jury, and sometimes even their executioner. And the argument here is that we as Christians are not to fulfill this role. We don't have the right, we don't have the authority to do this. But it's easier said than done, right? It doesn't have to be verbally expressed. It can be simply an attitude that we have in our hearts that prevents us from being an agent of truth and compassion. So let's not learn from Jonah's example. There's Jonah. He's angry with God. He doesn't answer God's question whether he's justified to be angry at the Ninevites uh, repenting. Instead, he leaves the city and he goes and he finds a place to sit and watch over the city. Have a look at verse 5. Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there, some, some shade. Now I'm thinking, th this is really remarkable, especially as a preacher. I mean, you've just preached a sermon that was literally the catalyst for a revival. Chapter 3, verse 5 says, everybody believed, from the greatest to the smallest, including the king. Everybody believed. I mean, if I was invited to go preach somewhere and it resulted in the entire city repenting, I mean, that would be incredible. Instead, what does Jonah do? He leaves town. He's not down there preaching and teaching. He's like, okay, what are we going to do? He starts some discipleship groups and you can be the worship leader and we'll have hospitality over there. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a big mega church. No, this is what he's doing. Verse carries on, he says, he sat under his little booth in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. He's sitting in hope that God will change his mind. He's sitting in judgment over the city and its people. He's metaphorically sitting on his high horse, but literally sitting on some hill looking down on the, on the city and on the people. See, John is very happy to be a recipient of God's compassion, but not an agent of it. And when you're not an agent of it, you then become an agent of condemnation. See, our fallen human nature, it doesn't do well with neutrality. We either like what we like, or we judge and condemn what we don't like. But as we've been saying, the book of Jonah is a, is a contrast primarily here between Jonah and God. So let's then ask the question, how does Jesus respond to some pretty uncomfortable situations where everyone is wanting to pronounce condemnation? So in John's gospel, we're told about this particular incident where the religious leaders of the day bring a woman before Jesus who has literally just been caught in adultery, in the act of adultery. They bring her before Jesus, and they, they're all about shaming and condemning her and wanting to stone her to death according to old covenant law. So what does Jesus do? And again, granted, this is more of a, a trap by the Pharisees than anything else, but look with me from John chapter 8 from verse 7. 
It says, and as they continued to ask him, Jesus, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, probably because they were wiser. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. So just a few things I want us to learn here regarding Jesus' example of not condemning. Firstly, we need to ask ourselves the question, are we without sin? Before we pass some sort of self-righteous judgment on someone, we've got to ask ourselves, hey, am I without sin? Do not answer yes. Because as we saw last week, we are all sinners in light of a very holy God. And because we are sinners, we do not have the right, we do not have the authority to condemn others. But secondly, we need to realize compassion is not void of truth. Notice Jesus has compassion on, on her, but tells her unequivocally, go and sin no more. Compassion is not void of morality. So what we can say is compassion confronts sin, but not with the motive of condemning, but with the motive of helping set that person free from it. It makes sense, right? If, if part of the point of compassion is to help people out of their circumstances, like poverty or whatever it might be, then it should include helping people out of their sin from the consequences that it can have on their lives. It all comes down to how we wield the truth, Sunrise. Jonah preached the truth, but with the hope and with the motive of condemning. But fortunately, God was sovereign over Jonah's intentions and brought about repentance. Or we can wield the truth in love so as to convict, not condemn, convict as in to open their eyes to their sin so that they can be, then be set free from it. So then, what does God do with this condemning, self-righteous prophet who's sitting up on this hill, looking down on the city? He continues to pursue Jonah, this time with an object lesson, so as to reveal his missional heart to Jonah. So point number three, we need to embrace God's missional heart as a way of fighting off self-righteousness. Because here's the deal, if Jonah and if you and I, if we're going to be representatives of Jesus, if we're going to be spokesmen for Jesus, then we need to have the heart of God. But like I said, the Lord is going to provide an object lesson here to expose what's truly grabbed hold of Jonah's heart in contrast to his. So there's Jonah. He's trying to get some shade under this little booth that he's constructed as he waits to see if God will change his mind. So watch what God does. Verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. There's your patient, uh, compassionate God. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And here we go, typical Jonah. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. So firstly, what we see here is the sovereignty of God over his creation on display yet again. Remember in chapter 2, God appointed, key word in the 
the book of Jonah. God appointed a giant fish to swallow Jonah. Here we see God appoints three more acts from creation that are supernatural for this object lesson. Firstly, this, this plant that grows magically in a day to provide shade for Jonah, then a worm to destroy the plant, and then the scorching east wind to make things really, really uncomfortable for Jonah. And Jonah's emotions tell us what has truly gripped his heart. Do you notice for the first time in the entire book, Jonah is so happy? He's exceedingly happy that, that he gets the shade now over his head. Literally, the text is, if you had to read it literally, Jonah rejoiced over the vine with great rejoicing. He's loving life. This is great. He is most happy when his own comfort has been satisfied. And he's most dissatisfied at the comfort of the Ninevites, having experienced mercy from God. Happy when his comfort has been satisfied, dissatisfied at the comfort of others. That's why when the Lord takes it away, he would rather die. And then God comes with the question again, which Jonah ignored earlier, verse 9. But Jonah, oh, sorry, but God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? And that's it. That's the end of the book. That's where it ends. There's no like, oh, Jonah realized it and, you know, repented and then went down and planted this huge big church in Nineveh. No, it's, it's left like that. Because the book was designed for us to assess who we are most like. Who are you identifying mostly with? Jonah or God? Here's what I think the Lord is saying to him. Saying, so Jonah... You pity the plant, and that word pity, by the way, means to grieve. It means to have your heart broken. It means to weep over something. And he's saying, yet, yet you had nothing to do with it. You're grieving over it simply because it brought you comfort. It brought you joy. And yet you had no control over its existence or its extinction. It was not yours to pity, but it was simply a gift that I gave you. And yet I who created you, I created the Ninevites, I created all humanity, I created everything you can see and can't see, and clearly you can see I'm in control of over absolutely everything. Surely I have the right to grieve over those who have fallen away from me. Daniel Aiken sums it up like this. He says, Jonah was concerned about a plant. God was concerned about people. Jonah had neither created nor nurtured the plant. But God had created and nurtured the people of Nineveh. Listen to this. Was it not the right that he, God, would extend to them his mercy and his grace? Is it not our responsibility to love and care for the lost like our Lord? That's the essence of the book. That's what the book is asking us. Are we going to love like God or are we going to love like Jonah? In fact, that phrase, who do not know their right hand from their left, is a figure of speech for spiritual darkness, spiritual blindness. Those who, who literally cannot discern uh, what is morally right and what is morally wrong in light of their creator God. And what we see here is God's missional heart of compassion for them. Again, that, that word pity means to have your heart broken, to grieve, to weep over. In contrast, self-righteousness will cause us to grieve over self-centered things, like our comfort. But a missional heart will have us grieve for the things that bring grief to God's heart, like lost souls, like a world that does not know its right hand from its left. And that's the test, Sunrise. That's our challenge 
as we look out at a world that is so confused, so confused about gender, gender identity, and, and, a, and a woke movement that wants to polarize the world into either oppressors or oppressed, a world still full of wars like Ukraine, Russia, Pac Palestine, Israel, wars out there, wars in here, wars in our home, wars between husband and wife, Deception, political deception, deception in the workplace. What would happen if the church, and I don't mean just us, the church globally, universally, what if the church became less like Jonah and more like God in the way we took the good news of Jesus into the world? So I'll be honest with you, I've been so personally convicted by this book, and you can ask Jay, the amount of times I said to her throughout this series, man, I feel just like Jonah. In fact, I think I said it yesterday. You know, I, I'll read some injustice in the world, or, or, or in my YouTube feed will, will show something about, you know, what someone is now saying, or what someone is now believing or, or doing in light of what they believe. Or, you know, I'll simply see someone in Kamana Bay or someone on, on Seven Mile Beach and, and I'll be filled with this, this judgment, the self-righteous judgment towards them or whatever it is. I feel like I'm, sometimes I'm like, I'm like Jonah sitting on this hill under the comfort of my shame. Shade, sorry. Shame as well. <laughs> Just passing out self-righteous judgment. And my only hope, and your only hope, if you can identify with me, is that our greater Jonah, our greater Jonah also went outside the city, but not to sit under the comfort of some shade, but rather to redeem the city. Not to go sit outside and look back and condemn it, but to redeem it. Instead of sitting under a plant, he was openly nailed to a tree. And as he looked out over the city, you remember what he said? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They don't know their right hand from their left. They need your compassion and they need your truth. You see, it's only through faith in Jesus, our greater Jonah, that our that our hearts of self-righteousness can begin to melt and our hearts, our missional hearts of God can grow stronger and stronger. And so through faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge, Sunrise, that it's coming out of this series. I'm going to ask it in three questions. And then we're going to pray together and ask the Lord to reveal the answers to these three questions. First question is this. Who is your Nineveh? Who is your Nineveh? Who should you be going to as opposed to running away from? Well, I'm just not going to go there. It's just too hard. Who's your Nineveh? Your Nineveh might be in your home. It might be in the workplace. It might be in your social circles. Our Nineveh as a faith family on mission to make Jesus known is this island of ours. And all of the places and the spaces where God puts us. Secondly, what is going on in your heart toward your Nineveh? So once you identify your Nineveh, what's going on in your heart toward it, to him or her? Like Jonah, is there something better that has gripped your heart? You know, is it a feeling of superiority or is it your, your idol of comfort? Hey, I'm just comfortable where I am. I'm just not going to go there. It's going to be too uncomfortable. And then lastly, what do we need to repent of so as to have the missional heart of God? Once we identify, what is that thing that's stopping me from going, stopping me from doing this? How do we repent of that? and embrace God's missional heart. Because who knows, Sunrise, who knows? 
God may grant repentance and you might have a revival. You might have a revival in your family. You might have a a revival with your colleague in the workplace or with your friends or, or whoever and wherever it is. So let's fight off self-righteousness and embrace God's missional compassion and truth that we find in Jesus. So let's pray and let's ask the Lord to continue his work in us. So just between you and the Lord, would you ask him to show you who your Nineveh is? Who have you been running away from and why? What is it? Who have you been hardened towards? Who are you feeling superior to? Who is it that you actually need to go to with the compassion and the truth of Jesus? Holy Spirit, would you just begin to reveal who that is or what that situation is in our hearts? Would you show us in our hearts too what what we need to repent of? What what is better that we're holding on to, but in fact it's not better? It's something that we're placing above you and above your will for us and above your will for the situation. Father, would you help us to have a missional heart like yours? Help us to make you known, Jesus, with hearts of truth and compassion. To not compromise on the truth, but also not to to go with an arrogance or, or superiority, but humbly take your truth in love. So, so that you can use us mightily, like you did Jonah, despite Jonah, to bring about the repentance of an entire city. We ask for your grace, we ask for your mercy upon us. And Father, as we sing this song, it just reminds us of the, compa- the compassion and the grace that you showered upon us. Help us go in that same grace and compassion. In Jesus' name, amen.